I found a data set that contains information about pretty much every Lego box out there from 1994 till 2022. The data set contains information about some classics like Lego City boxes, but it also has some licensed items that include things like Star Wars, the Marvel franchise, and my personal favorite of the group, Mario. It's a fun data set, but it's also strangely useful to me. I'm a dad now, and while my kid is not old enough for Legos just yet, you might be able to imagine why it feels important to me to understand how Lego prices all their boxes. The main question that I wonder about is that those licensed boxes, like those for Star Wars, well, I presume that Lego has to pay some sort of a license fee in order to make that toy. So that would imply that maybe you would pay more for every Lego piece than if you were to buy a normal Lego box. And as luck would have it, this data set allows me to answer that question because it has information about the number of minifigures, number of Lego pieces, and the retail price of every box. So in this video, I'm going to explore this question with a dashboard in Marimo. I'll start by diving into the data set itself so you can understand what we're dealing with. Then I'll explain to you some Marimo features that make it really fun to explore this data set with a proper dashboard. And then at the end, I will show you a unexpected conclusion for all you Lego fans out there. All right, so let's get started. I have a Polar's data frame over here. You can see that I'm loading up the Lego sets.csv file. And you're also gonna notice that I'm filtering a little bit. I do wanna have items that have an actual US retail price. There's also a couple of categories in here that I'm not interested in. So Lego apparently also has books and video games, etc. That's super cool, but I'm just interested in normal Lego boxes. So I'm filtering on that. And then I um, we're gonna do things with themes later. And for now, I just wanna have themes that actually appear quite often. So there's a couple of themes that only happen once for one box, like a special occasion. Uh, that's fun and cool, but I only want to have some themes in here that are actually somewhat popular. And then this is the data set that we end up with. So you can see that I've got a set ID over here. There's also a name. There's also a year. And oh, I thought 94 was the minimum. Apparently we have older sets as well. Okay, something I learned. Uh, but then you can see that we have a theme. So there's apparently a theme of trains. There's also a theme group there. These are modern day trains. Nine volts, I guess, is the battery that's included for these trains that might change over time. I'm not exactly 100% sure, but um, then we get to this next bit that says how many pieces are there. So there's eight pieces in this set. There are no minifigures. Um, sometimes they also have like a age range, like what's the minimum age range. There is also a US retail price. And a thing that I think is particularly neat about the data frame viewer inside of Marimo is that whenever there is a image URL, then we can go ahead and fetch it to put in this data frame. So if we were to just, I don't know, just print uh, this data frame over here, then you can see that we actually have some URLs. And let's just look at the image URL. Let's turn that into a list. And then we can see that, yeah, there is a URL in here that ends with .jpg. I think if it does .png, we also show it. Uh, but that is good enough for Marimo to have a data frame widget that actually shows you the item in question. And I suppose one thing that's kind of cool now to do just to also explore what we can do from this widget is we can do things like, uh, let's just select the name, the year, and sure the theme, and then also the pieces, minifigs, and US retail price. Together with that image URL, then we end up with something that's just a little bit more bite size. And one thing that's kind of neat that we can do now is we can just hover over this hover glass at the bottom. This gives us a search panel, and then I can really start searching for anything. So if I were to type Star Wars over here, then you're gonna see it finds some Star Wars things because there's a theme called Star Wars. It's able to filter, I can see the years, but I can also see some of these Lego boxes. So these are, I think some of the original Star Wars items that you could buy. Imperial Star Destroyer, there you go. Uh, but if I were now to type, I don't know, Marvel uh, in there, uh, then we see some of the Marvel things that you could buy. Uh, personally, I'm a little bit more of a Star Wars person myself, but we can, of course, also type in Mario. We see some of the fun Mario items in here as well. And uh, we also have a different theme like Lego City. And these are like the police cars and the police stations and the fire station, the fire trucks, etc. All these different boxes have different US retail prices. But the thing, of course, that's going to be interesting to research is, OK, it's one thing to be more or less expensive, but how many pieces do you actually get? And I'm using Lego pieces here as a rough approximation of the value that you're getting. This isn't 100% aligned or correct because it also depends on what kinds of pieces. Some pieces are cheaper than others. Uh, there's also these minifigures that we maybe want to think about. Uh, this is not going to be a perfect analysis. I'm sorry about that. We don't have the data for it, but we can at least have something of a proxy. We can say something about the price per piece 
and we can check, hey, does that maybe depend on the theme? Are pieces in a Star Wars box in general more expensive than a piece from a city box, let's say? That kind of feels like a fun little exercise, like a fun little dashboard that I want to make, something that can help explain that to me. And as a preview, uh, this is what the final dashboard is going to look like. Uh, there is a selector on top over here where I'm able to select a theme, if you would. So uh, we can do something like city. That's something that we can select that's already selected. Uh, creator, I think, is also uh, one of the items that I can select. And a Duplo is also an item I can select. So I can select different themes. And whenever I do, a summary appears over here. This is a uh, statistic that we can show. This is the average piece price. So you can see that uh, City has a price, Creator has a price, and Duplo, they all have a price. So that's something I can just quickly show. And then down below over here, there's a chart, and that chart has a couple of selection items as well. So I can say like, hey, I'm only interested in seeing items from a specific range of the year, only a specific price range, because Lego boxes, they can get super expensive, ex especially the Star Wars Lego, which we'll get into in a bit. But in order to reduce that, you can just uh, slide that down. And typically that does give you a better chart down below over here. Piece price range you can set, and uh, you can specify the X and Y axes from here as well. So uh, maybe we can say something about the price as time moved on. And it's kind of hard to see with all of these dots. So what you can also do is just add a uh, lowest line, which is kind of like a an average of sorts. And yeah, the, the lines are easiest to look at if you compare the pieces with the price. But uh, one thing that is really cool about the way this is set up is that this is, of course, a Altair chart. And Marimo has a feature that allows you to make selections. So what I am able to do is just make a quick selection over here. And then down below, you can see the items that I just selected. So apparently, uh, the items that I just selected over there uh, includes R2-D2 from Star Wars. So, okay, that, that is all fairly neat. We're going to do our analysis in a, in a moment, but what I want to do first is just explain to you how you can build something like this yourself using Marimo. So how do you make these dashboards then? Well, the main thing really is you have to be aware of these input elements that Marimo gives you. They are typically found in this Marimo UI submodule. And just to give a example, I've got a multi-select item over here. Everything is being stored in a multi-select variable. And you can see that there are some default settings. I'm saying things like, hey, you can't have more than five selections. And here are some starting values. But all the values that it can pick from have to be calculated up front. And that's what I'm doing with Pogers over here. I'm having a look at my data frame and I'm checking every single theme and I'm calculating the length of them. And that way I have a theme column that only has all the themes once in it. Those are unique. And I'm turning that into a list. If I wanted to, I could also do some extra filtering in here with the group by. I'm not doing that, but okay. Uh, themes go in there. And this gives me a multi-select widget. So uh, I can show it over here. And one thing I can also do just for good measure is show you the value of it. And as you can see, whenever I interact with this item, the value underneath this object also automatically updates. And that's the reactive nature of Marimo for you. But you can imagine that if you're able to do this with a Python value, then you can also do this to maybe update some a little bit of UI. And uh, two things to know about that, like, first of all, you can just have a multi-select appear uh, like this, and that's already something you could use in a dashboard. It can be nicer to add some formatting and presentation around that. And one thing you could do is you can have a markdown cell, and you can just use curly brackets like what I'm doing down below over here to inject a UI element. So that is something you could do. It makes a lot of sense. And I would argue uh, you can add a header. It makes it look quite nice. So that's a pretty good habit. But from there, you also want to have, in this case, a summary. So if you have a look at this cell over here, you can see that I've got all these different uh, stats. And these stats appear because I have some selections. If I remove Monkey Kid from the selection, you see these stats update as well. And what's happening in here? Well, let's just move things around just a little bit so it's easier to read. So I have some sort of a final data frame where all the filtering has been done. And what I'm doing is I'm saying like, look, uh, grab the theme column, again, do an aggregation, calculate the mean, that's the piece price, that's one of the columns I calculate. So that's the price that you would have to pay per piece on average, and then turn that into a list of dictionaries such that I can use a list comprehension here. And this is the list comprehension in question. I'm making a mo.stat object for every single dictionary that I'm making. So for every theme, I'm making a stat object appear. And this is just a very nice Marimo object that allows you to show a big number and add a little bit of context around it. So you can remind the user this is the average piece price and this is for the city theme. I've got this list comprehension over here and then I'm stacking all of that horizontally, which is what this MO uh, H stack function does over here. And there's some extra settings that I added, like uh, I want the widths of all these stat boxes to be equal. I want the gap to be equal to one. Uh, these are like little aesthetic things. You can, you know, make it bigger and there's a wider gap and, you know, feel free to play around with that. But uh, this is really it. 
from here, you know, uh, this is what Marimo does. You have reactive cells, so if a cell updates or if a UI updates, all of the children's cells will update automatically as well, which is very convenient if you're making dashboards. But a lot of the art of making a good dashboard in Marimo does boil down to, hey, are you aware of all these building blocks that are available to you. So the multi-select is definitely one of them. Horizontal stacking, vertical stacking, that's also one thing. But this mo.stat, that is also definitely a thing uh, that is very useful if you're making dashboards, I would say. Now, besides selecting a theme, I'm also doing a bunch of other things down below over here. And, you know, it's different elements, but it's basically the same idea. I've got a checkbox over here. Um, I've got ranges over here that allow you to set two values. So you can actually do like a range slider. And here is a simple drop down that allows you to select one and only one element. It really works the same way as the multi-select item I just showed you. It's just that these are different UI elements. But again, once you update anything here, cells below will update automatically. There's a link in the show notes if you want to check out all the code. And if you want to go to the docs, uh, all these input elements can be found in the mo.ui uh, submodule. So that's also a good place uh, to have a look. Anywho, all of that brings me to this final part, which I think is also the coolest party trick in the entire notebook. So in the cell, we're making an Altair chart. First, I'm making this subset data frame given all the inputs. We have a final subset that we're interested in charting. Then I just make my Altair chart as I would normally. Then I might draw some extra lines, which is what I'm doing over here. But uh, the real quote unquote magic is happening down below right there. The normal Altair chart goes into this function and then an Altair chart that really looks the same is going out. And what's so nice about this? Well, the X axis over here has the number of pieces in a Lego box. The Y axis here shows you a price. You can see different clusters appear based on the theme of the box. But what if you want to make a selection now? Just select a few boxes like, I don't know, some of the more expensive Star Wars boxes, let's say. Well, I can make a selection down here and then in the data frame below, you can confirm that indeed the expensive Lego boxes are Star Destroyers and the Millennium Falcon and that robot thingy. I can also go back up and maybe select the expensive Duplo items. And what's that then? Oh yeah, that makes sense. Those are the train sets. It's one thing to have a nice looking chart and having a nice looking chart is great. Also being able to make a selection, that's the cherry on top. And just a cool party trick, I can hit this show line chart checkbox. And when I now go down, you can actually see that I've got these summary lines that try to mimic in a non-linear way how the cluster is behaving. So you can actually quite clearly see that there's a red line that behaves differently from the blue line, etc. And these lines are effectively just an overlay. I'm still able to make my selection of the points under it, and that will definitely still appear at the bottom. This notebook is currently running in edit mode, by the way, but I can go down below over here, hit this toggle app view button, and then this will run in app mode. And then you get the full experience of what the notebook is supposed to be like. This is the dashboard that I want to show to myself or potentially an end user. And, and to now maybe conclude by actually doing the little analysis that I was interested in doing. Um, I have Duplo, I have City, I have Star Wars. Let's maybe also go for Marvel. And let's actually also make the line chart appear. Well, if I then have a look at just these lines, right, then it seems that by far the most expensive Lego set out there when I go by the number of pieces, right? All of them don't have that many pieces, but we do see quite a high price. Now, why is that? Well, the reason is that this is all Duplo, and that's a brand of Legos that's really meant for super small children, and those bricks are significantly bigger. So it's not necessarily fair to compare them to normal Legos. So just for good measure, what I figured I might do is I might remove Duplo and I might introduce uh, Marvel superheroes and the creator sets in their stead. And there's an interesting thing here. So the orange line, that's the creator set and the blue line on top over here, that's the city set. And it seems that in between, we've got sets that actually would require a license. The creator set and the city set are actually fully owned by Lego as far as I know. And what I can do is I can just have a quick look it's some of the more expensive uh, creator sets out there. And, you know, these are not necessarily super fancy. It really feels like these are parts that are ubiquitous in the Lego ecosystem. So that might help explain why that's actually a theme that is cheaper. But the simple conclusion at this point in time, if I just look at aggregate statistics, especially when prices tend to go up a bit more, then it's hard to really say that Lego boxes that have a license are inherently more expensive. That just doesn't seem to hold. So I was wondering why I actually thought that. And then I noticed that maybe I should increase this price range slider to go all the way to the maximum value. And then you start seeing some interesting things, namely that if you were to select all the most expensive items in this list, and let me turn off the 
line chart there. These are all the most expensive items in this data set. Well, those are all the super expensive Lego Star Wars boxes. And if you go to a toy store, which I occasionally do with my kid, then it's those boxes that really grab the most attention. So it also makes sense that there's a bit of a bias in me to think that these are then also more expensive in general. Anyway, this was a fun exercise nonetheless. Links are in the show notes. You can find the data set as well as this notebook. And if you're going to analyze this data set yourself, and if you find a different conclusion or something interesting, uh, leave a note down below. I would love to read it. Lego is super interesting. Thanks for listening. And if you hit subscribe and a like maybe, then you'll see another video of me appear in your feed next time around.